Amen. So the title of the sermon this morning is The Importance of Patience. The Importance of Patience. And if you would, look there in James chapter 5, uh, beginning of verse 7, where the Bible reads, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until received the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and ye have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. So, of course, patience is a word that's coming up several times here just in this one uh, passage alone, and there's a lot we can learn about patience, but one of the first things we have to understand about patience is even what does that mean? A lot of people, they probably have a, a, you know, a, a vague idea of what it means to be patient, but what, what we want to look at this morning is what does it mean to be patient in terms of the Bible? What does the Bible define as patience? How are we to be patient as God's people? So <clears throat> patience, you know, it's more than just waiting. People think, oh, you're a very patient person if you can just stand there you know, and wait at the DMV, or if you can, you know, wait your turn at, what, at whatever it is you're doing, that you must be a very patient person. But that's not necessarily true. I'm sure there's a lot of people that are in situations like that, that we all have to go through where we're inconvenienced, or we have to wait for something for this or that. And we, we might appear to be very patient outwardly. You know, we're, we're very, we're, we're, we're keeping calm. We're not seeming anxious, but inwardly, you know, we're saying, what's taking so long? You know, how long is this going to go on for? Why can't they just get this done already? We probably go through with that. You know, we go through something like that practically every day. Any of us that, uh, you know, have to do any kind of waiting on other people. You know, I finished the sermon and then this morning we're packing up the kids into the car and I'm already having to remind myself, patience, you know, it's going to take time to get the car seats in. You know, it's going to take time to get all their belongings and make sure they're all settled and ready to go. I know the clock's ticking and there's a long drive down there. We got to go, 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 all the stuff to do. But sometimes we have to exercise patience. And what is patience really? Patience, patience is, you know, it's the ability not to just to endure a frustrating or difficult circumstance, but to actually have, a, you know, the right attitude while you're going through it. Not and allow it, to, not and allow it to, to vex you or give you a bad attitude or cause you to become impatient. You know, patience is something, it's not just waiting, it's how you're doing it. The attitude that you have while you're waiting. Now, if you would, turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Keep something in James 5. we we'll probably be coming back. But go over to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. We'll get there in a minute. But, uh, you know, patience is something that's very important. It's very important that we as God's people not only understand what patience is, but that we understand how important it is to have this proper attitude of patience. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 7, Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. So we could see right here from this verse that, you know, what is, the, what is the opposite of being patient? Well, it says here it's being angry. It's being hasty in thy spirit. It's being angry. And it also comes from a, a spirit of pride. Often pride, proud people are very impatient people. They want what they want now because they deserve it. And they shouldn't have to wait for anybody else because of who they are. So being an impatient person, they, you know, they, 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 uh, they, they're going to be hasty. They're going to be angry. And we don't want to be those kind of people. We want to be people who are very, uh, uh, very uh, you know, not hasty, not rash, not angry people, but gentle, meek people, as the Bible we'll see here goes on and describes uh, the type of attitude we should have. But it says here that the end of a thing is better than the beginning thereof. And the thing about an impatient person is, is that they rarely see the end of a thing. I mean, so often, you know, many, any, many things that we start out doing in life, you know, that are long term, you know, we want to see the end of it. But if we lose patience and waiting for that, that fruition to come, we're never going to see the end of a thing. You know, people get so caught up in starting this and starting that. But if they're not patient in their spirit, they're not going to see the end of it. And the Bible says that the end of a thing is better than the beginning thereof. You know, it's better to accomplish a task than to start out doing one. I mean, we just entered the new year, and I'm sure there's a lot of people that have a lot of, you know, New Year's resolutions. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. But I'm telling you, it's going to take patience. It's going to take the ability to go through hard circumstances with the right attitude in order to see uh, those goals accomplished. 
For you to reach the end of the year and see the end of a thing that you started out, that's going to take patience. And impatient people, you know, they're often very proud people, as I mentioned, and, you know, they consider waiting beneath them. You know, they'll say, well, it's, it's beneath me to have to wait on somebody else. You could think about, you know, the, the, the big shot who walks into a, you know, very, you know, crowded restaurant, very popular restaurant, and he's like, where's my table? You know, he immediately expects everyone to just clear, uh, clear the room and make uh, room for him, you know, because he's impatient. He doesn't feel like he should have to wait for anybody else, that uh, he shouldn't have to, uh, that's beneath him, right? And we should not be those type of people. We should be people who are very patient and not think that it's something that's it's beneath us. And because here's the thing, in order to see the end of a thing, you're going to have to be humble and understand that you're going to have to do some waiting, that you're going to have to be patient and wait uh, on others and even yourself in circumstances. And I read a quote when I was uh, writing this. I thought this is very good. I think it ties in with Scripture quite well. It says, patience is sister to meekness. You know, patience is sister to meekness. They're so closely related. You know, they're, you know one complements the other. They're, they're hand in glove, right? Patience is sister to meekness. It takes a very meek person to be a very patient person. Like I said, as, a, as the scripture shows us right there, that the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. A proud person is somebody who is not meek, right? So patience is sister to somebody who is a very meek person. You'll often see people who have, a, you know, a, a real genuine humility about them. They'll be able to endure, you know, other people. They'll be able to endure difficult and, and uh, unpleasant circumstances easier than an impatient person who does not have that meekness. It says, patience is sister to meekness and humility is its mother. You know, where are you going to find your, uh, patience? Where, how are you going to become a patient person? By getting humble, by realizing that the whole world doesn't revolve around you, that we're not all on, on, on one another's timetable. You know, we're not on every, not everybody's on our schedule. You know, not, the traffic isn't going to flow at our, our, you know, beck and call. You know, the red light is just as long for everybody else as it, as it is us. And to become, you know, it's going to take some humility and understand that we're, you know, we're, we're nothing special in that sense. So <clears throat> that's what patience is. You know, it's something that comes from humility. It's something that is very close to kin to somebody being a, a meek individual. And it's the complete opposite of being a proud person. <clears throat> now, why is patience import important? That's the title of the sermon. Import the importance of patience. You know, uh, what, what is so important about it? And why is it something that we should desire to have? Well, it's important for several reasons. And one of the, probably one of the primary reasons is it's not optional for those who want to uh, succeed in the Christian life especially. You know, if you want to succeed as a Christian in living for the Lord and staying faithful to God and His Word and, 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 and all of that, you know, it's going to require a great deal of patience. Because here's the thing, you know, when, you, when you're living for God, you, you still have the flesh. You know, the, the, the spirit is at enmity with the flesh. These two are contrary to one, one to another so that you cannot do the things that you would. And we have to fight that battle every day. You know, we have, uh, we have an enemy in the world. The world is not a, you know, pro-Christian world. They're not, the, the devil is not out there trying to make it easy for us to live a Christian life. The world is not embracing, uh, you know, biblical values. They're going the complete opposite direction. So there's, you know, just by the nature of, of, the, of living a Christian life, you're going to come into conflict with your own self, your own flesh, you know, spiritual forces in the devil, and even the world itself. Co-workers, family, friends, whatever it might be. Uh, so it's going to take a great deal of patience in order for you to succeed, to make it for the long haul, to be in this thing until the end. So why is patience so important this morning? Because it's not an option if you want to succeed. You know, if not succeeding is if succeeding is not important to you, if you don't, if you're not worried about whether or not you're going to flake out in a few years, or you're just going to throw in the towel and just say, "Well, this isn't for me anymore," and just go back to the world and, and live a worldly life, you know, patience probably isn't going to be that important to you. It's not going to be something that you have to work on. But if you are going to make it, if you are going to uh, hang in there, you're going to have to become a patient person. You're going to have to become meek, and you're going to have to become patient. So. <clears throat> you know, and, and one area that we think of as Christians that, uh, in particular, that we want to be patient about is the coming of the Lord. That's what James started talking about there in the beginning where we read. He said, be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. You know, we, we, we long in our spirit for the Lord to come. You know, we were just talking the other night, uh, me and some brethren, about, you know, maybe the Lord will come in our lifetime. And again, I don't see anything preventing His return 
in this lifetime other than you know the rise of the antichrist and we, we know that you know the, the man of sin must be revealed first and then he shall come but you know it might might not be that he does come in our lifetime it very well might be that you know might be another few generations who knows it could be a few more hundred years you know we don't we don't know but we have to be patient and uh that's one area that people as Christians need to, 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 to understand that, you know, the Lord might not just show up and deliver us out of all these troubles that we're going to have to go through. So we might as well, in the meantime, you know, dig in and understand what it's going to take to live the Christian life all the way to the end. You know, even if it means we have to go to the grave before we see the Lord, we need to develop patience unto his coming. So patience is important for several reasons. And one of the reasons it's important is not only because it's necessary, but because patience is what's going to help you get along with other people. Patience is going to help you get along with other people. You know, I don't care who it is or what circumstance it is. You need to be patient in order to get along with other people. <clears throat> and if you would, if you kept something there in James, I hope you kept something there in James chapter 5. Look at verse 9. You'll notice this is tied in with patience so often. He'll talk about patience and then he'll talk about how we should treat others. He'll talk about patience and he'll talk about how we should treat brethren how we should treat the lost, how, what our attitude should be like towards others. Because patience is so interwoven with that. You know, we can't, if you want to get along with other people, you're going to have to learn to be patient and put up with people. And, you know, they're going to do the same for you, you know. And, and that's, that's where humility comes in, where we realize, you know, I'm just as much of a pain in the neck sometimes as anybody else. He says there, you know, he starts out talking about patience, and he says in verse, uh, well, it's beginning in verse 8, be, there, be also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Then he starts out in verse 9. He's not shifting gears. These things are, they, they complement one another. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the Lord. He's saying, like, look, the Lord is coming. The judge standeth before the, 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 before the door. You need to be patient, but not only that, grudge not against uh, one another. And he says, uh, well, that's the point there, you know, that we need to not grudge towards one another. We should be forgiving people. We should be long-suffering people. That's another word for patience. We should be very merciful and pitiful, just as the Lord is, full of compassion, ready to forgive. That is a patient person. That requires a great deal of humility. Now, we have to understand, you know, you say, well, that, that sounds easy. I mean, I, it's so easy to just get along with everybody in church, right? We all believe the same thing, and, and everyone's just glad to be here every time they walk through the door, and how, how could we ever need patience with brethren? He says there, you know, uh, uh, be patient, uh, grudge not one against one another, brethren, right? Who in the world would ever grudge against uh, anybody else in church? It happens all the time. And the bigger the church gets and the more people that come in, the more different types of personalities and backgrounds and stages of life that start to mix and intermingle in this church, the more need there's going to be for each and every one of us to be patient with one another and not hold grudges and to let things go. So, but that's not to say that, you know, everyone has to be best friends with everyone. I don't want to go to the other extreme. Some people interpret that and say, well, that just means everybody has to just, you know, lock arm in arm and, and, and just, you know, uh, be best buddies. No, that's not what I'm saying. All we're saying is that patience, you know, helps us get along within a church specifically because it allows us to remain civil with one another, to not grudge, to remain civil to remain kind, to remain long-suffering. That's what patience does for us. You know, but of course, patience applies beyond just the, the walls of the church. It goes f you know, into every area of our life, every relationship that we have, every circumstance we could find ourselves in. How about with unbelievers? Right? We're going to be running into un unbelievers all the time, people who you know, don't believe in Christ, people who are unsaved, people who reject the Bible. Uh, that, you know, they, they abound. We ourselves were, were such at one time before we came to a saving knowledge of Christ. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, and then it says this, be patient toward all men. He didn't say some men. He didn't say, you know, towards those people that you like. You know, pe towards people that have similar interests as you. People that can benefit you. Be patient towards them. He said, no, but you need to be patient towards all men. You know, the, the unruly, the feeble-minded, the weak, all of them. You need to be patient towards all people. He goes on and says, seeing that you render not evil for evil unto any man. You know, we should, we should be patient people in the sense that we're not trying to just get somebody back. You know, somebody does us wrong, 
somebody does, you know, says something or does something that we didn't like, that we're offended, and now it's just going to become our goal in life to make sure that we one-up them, that we get them back. You know, that's not the attitude that we're to have. That's not the attitude that Christ had. That's not the, 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 the example that he set. You know, he, when he reviled, he reviled not again, the Bible says. And he says to not render evil for evil to, unto any man, lost, saved, in church, out of church, whoever it is. But ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves, he's saying within the church, do this, you know, this applies in the church house, just as, and he says, and, and to all men. Ever follow that which is good among yourselves and to all men. So, you know, patience is something that's not just for amongst, you know, like-minded people. It's for others as well. People who are, do not share the same, you know, worldview that we have. We are to be patient with them. Now, he does say, warn the unruly. There is a time and place to, 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 to warn the wicked, to say, hey, you're wrong here. You know, this isn't right. But to do it, you know, and to and, 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 uh, speak the truth in love, as Paul did. That's ought to be the attitude that we have. Why is it that we want to warn them? You know, so that they'll get right, not just so we can say, well, I'm right and you're wrong, and, you know, get puffed up about it. Now, if you're there in 1 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse uh, 22. He says, Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord have a pure heart. You know, what's he saying there? Get in church, right? And he's saying, look, follow righteousness with who? With them that call on the Lord have a pure heart. It's good to be with like-minded believers. It's good to, you know, come together in the assembly and to not forsake that and to, to hear the preaching word of God and to have the fellowship that we have in Christ. He goes on and says in verse 23, But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. Again, like he was saying in 1 Thessalonians, you know, this isn't a pick and choose thing. Who I'm going to be gentle towards, who I'm going to be patient with. He's saying, look, it's for everybody. Gentle to all men, apt to, pe apt to teach, patient. That's the attitude that we have to have towards everybody. He goes on and says, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. So that's why we need to be patient is that to have that kind of gentle, meek attitude that wants to teach and instruct in a patient, loving, kind manner you know, uh, towards the lost so that they can recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. You know, and if they have a nasty attitude towards us, you know, it, it, that shouldn't matter. We should still want to, you know, reach that person with the gospel. Um, you know, patience really is what's going to allow you to go out there in the world and take it on the chin. You know, the world's going to lash out and, and be vulgar and crude and crass and, and mean and nasty at times. And the Christian isn't supposed to just retaliate in turn. You know, we should be able to take that on the chin and understand, hey, you know what? These people are lost. Let's, let's, as the saying goes, let's kill them with kindness. You know, you, you, get more, you get more flies with honey than vinegar. So that ought to be our, our attitude we're out in the world. And I think a lot of times uh, in churches where there's a, a, you know, a leather lung preacher that's getting up and saying, thus saith the Lord, and preaching the whole counsel of God, you know, gets up and when he needs to, rips face and calls out sin and, and calls out iniquity. You know, that's great here behind the pulpit. You know, we need that as Christians to be reminded that the whole world lieth in wickedness. You know, that we don't want to get brainwashed by this culture in adopting their philosophies, that we have to let this uh, rule our hearts and minds. Let the, the word of God, that's what the preaching's for. But that's not what we take out into the world when we go out soul winning, when we go out knocking doors, you know, and, and trying to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're not, we're not going to there to like turn to Leviticus 20.13 and I'm going to show you something, you know. We're there to take him to John 3.16, you know, and show him that. And, and uh, you know, that's what's going to allow you, and it's patience that's going to allow you to do that. Because so often, you know, we want to retaliate in our flesh. We want to straighten people out and tell them why they're wrong and why we're right. Because we have a more sure word of prophecy. And it's not that we're right, it's that this is right, and that's what we're standing on. But patience is what's going to allow you to go out there and endure all of that and take it on the chin. You know, I thought of some examples from this trip that we just took to Morency, trying to... to uh, you know, knocked doors there. It was a very, very cold place, very unreceptive. Um, we, had, we had several teams going out for several hours. That's why we, and a lot of those numbers were, were you know, um, older kids that they, some folks ran into uh, at a park or something like that and got to talk to some kids at the door. So, but a lot of the adults there were just already so hardened. You know, they were already just so disinterested and just 
Didn't want to hear. I mean, I didn't get a chance to give the gospel one time. You know, after several hours going on, just knocking door after door, and it wasn't very spread out. It was very densely populated. And I even remember at one point, I'm walking down, uh, I'm walking down the street, and this lady. I mean, she's like, she's like on the other side of the parking lot from here. And you know, we'd already been by her house because we'd already been on that side, and maybe left a little invite or something on her door. So, and then she must have seen the Bible and thought, oh, made the connection, and she just instantly. No, thank you. You know, just gets this real, like she just take a bit, bite out of a lemon, <laughs> just starts wagging her head at me. And, and I was told she said, no, thank you. I am assuming that's what she said. She might have said something else. But just walking off in a huff, you know, I put, one, I put one invite on somebody's door. and We parked the van. I put a little YouTube card, you know, they can watch the Bible Way to Heaven and some movies that are for free there. And we go on to the next door. Then I come back to get the van like an hour later. Somebody had taken the time to take that out of their door and walk down to the van and stick it in, our, in, the, in the window of our van. I've never had that happen. And I was like, well, you know, at least they gave it back. You know, we can use it somewhere else. You know, maybe they were just trying to be polite. But what were they really trying to do? Send a message. We don't want this here. You know, we, we're not interested. No thanks. You know, it wasn't enough for them to just say, oh, you know, whatever. They had to make the point of going down there. That's kind of, a, kind of an antagonistic type of thing to do. You know, what, what was my reaction when I saw that lady wagging her head at me? You know, who are you to tell me no? You're not, you know, go run, chase her down, and <laughs> let me tell you why you should be, you know. I mean, quite honestly, I, I kept it to myself. It was, you know, I, I just laughed. <laughs> I thought it was humorous, you know. Here's this lady just laughed. She's just so triggered by the Bible, you know, by, by the fact that somebody's doing this. I thought it was, you know, it's, it's sad really is what it is. It's unfortunate. But, I mean, it allowed me to take, patience is what allowed me to just take that on the chin. And say, well, you know, I mean, was it really that bad? Oh, some old lady, you know, shook her head at me. Ooh, such persecution. But there were other things going on. You know, that same, that same neighborhood. We're knocking on a door, and these, there's these little dogs. Just, there were so many dogs there, you know. And uh, it was very resish, you know, is what we called it. So many dogs. And uh, we go in, and these, these little yippy dogs, you know, the type that just, they just don't shut up the whole time. You know, and they're just barking, barking. Finally, the neighbor... The guy right next door just goes, shut those dogs up. And I'm thinking, it's not my dogs, man. Believe me, if they're my dogs, they'd be airborne by now. And they'd be <laughs> boom. They're the perfect size for punting. I'm kidding, kind of. But <laughs> I would never kick a dog. That's one bit of advice my dad gave me. Never kick a dog because you could sprain your ankle. <laughs> it's an old Indian saying you wouldn't understand. But uh, anyway. So this guy, he's already upset because these dogs just, and I can understand, I'm already sympathizing with the guy. I'm like, yeah, man, this would drive me nuts. But unfortunately, we walk out and he knows what, what we're doing because he before we even get to his gate, he's already at the door. Not interested, slams the door. He's already upset. And I, you know, I said, well, pff, man, what a jerk. No, I just said, man, this guy's, you know, obviously he's upset about the dogs. It's unfortunate, it's sad. You know, but I was patient with them. You know, I didn't just, well, let me tell you why you should be interested. I didn't yell back at them, you know, and, and get into it or try and want to mix it up. And we need to be, pa that's why we need to be patient with people, especially in this area of soul winning, because what is it we're trying to do? We're trying to, you know, get them to recover themselves from the snare of the devil. We want to be patient so that we can, in meekness, instruct those that oppose themselves. See, we, get, we think so often, you know, that little lady shaking her head at me. She's not. She's opposing herself. That guy's not interested in me. He's opposing himself. He, he's, he's his own worst enemy by rejecting the gospel. And you don't have to actually go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, but I'll remind us of the story of, uh, of Samuel. When Samuel was coming to the end of his life and they were uh, getting ready to choose another leader and they wanted a king. It wasn't the end of his life, but they're getting ready to, to choose a king. And Samuel didn't want anything to do with it. And he said in 1 Samuel 8, Then the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel and to Ramah, and said unto him, unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. And if recall, the Lord said, you, shall, you told them not to make themselves a king. Now here they are wanting to make a king like, so they could be like everybody else. And it says in verse 6, But these things displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. You know, that's what I think about so often when someone slams a door in my face or says they're not interested or tells me off 
or rejects what I'm trying, the gospel that we're trying to preach. Because it's not me they're rejecting. It's Christ. It's the Lord. It's the message of the Bible that they're rejecting. Whether it's out soul winning, whether it's in a church service, whether it's just in conversation, when, when, the, top, when, the, when, the, when the topic at hand is, is biblical and you're giving scriptural truth and a person rejects it, and, and even if they do it in an offensive way, you have to understand something. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting the Bible. You know, and they're just, they're just kind of want to take the messenger out with them as well okay, in, the, in, the, in the process. <clears throat> you know, how could we, a real simple way to prove this would be go back to Marenzi, to that same neighborhood, to that same guy that wasn't interested, and show up with a jumbo check that said $1 million with his name on it. You watch how quickly that door flies open. And it could be me bringing it. The same guy who was making, you know, getting the dogs all upset and riled up by being there, who, had, who was just trying to bring, you know, going to come over and thump him with the Bible, whatever he thought. You know, if I showed up tomorrow with a, with a big fat check for him, balloons and a camera, man, he'd be out in his front yard. Yeah, here I am. It's me pulling out his ID. See, it's me, you know. Give me the check. Why? Because it's not me that, has, it's not me that he's rejecting. It's not me that he he's wants to see so badly. It's that check. It's the message that I'm bringing. You know, and that's what's being rejected here. When people are not interested in the gospel, they're not rejecting you. And this is something we, especially those of us that go soul winning, we have to understand this because especially when you first start out soul winning, you know, this is something a lot of people, a hurdle they have to overcome. They get, they get so personally offended by somebody slamming a door or telling them interest. You know when that guy, before I could even get near his, the, the, the entrance to his gate, that same guy, not interested, you know, and slammed the door. I was in my heart thankful. I was like, well, thanks for sparing me the walk. You know, now I can just get on to the next door to a guy that is. I'm, I'm serious, though. And when people are very quick to tell me they're not interested, I'm grateful. Yep. I don't go, oh, well, you know, I'm not like, what is it, man? You know, I got to change a cologne or something? You know, I got something in my teeth? What's the matter? It must be me. You know, it's, I already understand it's this that they're rejecting, and I'm, and I'm glad that they're you know, just getting it out of the way and letting me know right up front that they're not interested. <laughs> you know, another great example of this is that is, uh, we had another guy, uh, he was out soul winning in Marenzi, and he was talking to some, some teenage kids, you know, 12, 13, 14, some boys, and he was giving them the gospel, you know, and they were getting it, and I think one of them got saved. But in the process, the dad, he either came home, I don't know, but the dad took notice and saw what was going on. And uh, the dad just comes running at him, I mean, just full speed, like, hey, what's going on here? Because the dad was under the impression that uh, this, uh, the guy that was preaching, uh, Brother John, was that he was, uh, he was either a Jehovah Witness or Mormon, you know? And this guy, this dad turned out to be a Christian, that he actually was raised in a Baptist church and everything. But he saw that and he was like, you know, he was going to object. Now, was he going to object because the brother giving the gospel, you know, had his hair wrong? You know, or because he wore glasses or, you know, no, he was mad at the, because he didn't know what message was being brought. You know, they reject what, what was being preached to his kids. And when he found out that it was the gospel, that it was the true, pure word of God, he was thankful and he walked away. And in fact, the next day, Saturday morning, before we went out, we were gathered uh, in a parking lot there in town eating donuts like all good Baptists do. And, and the guy was driving by and he just pulled over and he came up and just walked right up to us and just said, hey, thanks for coming out here. And just he stood and talked with us for about 45 minutes, just expressed his gratitude and and uh, he's even going to potentially get in contact with me when we go back and, and I take him and some of his uh, other saved brethren out there uh, and show them how to go soul winning. But, but why is that? Why did he go from be having this, you know, aggressive, apprehensive, you know, confrontational attitude to the next day he's, you know, hey, when are you coming back? Can we go with you? What was that? What changed? It's when he understood what was being preached. So again, you know, the point being, you know, the one reason you need to be patient out there with people is because... They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting the message. So be patient and understand that. that that's something that's going to help us to be patient with folks. Now, you're there in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I mean, I, I thought about this verse several times during this trip. He says in verse 14, he said, Now thanks be unto God, which causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the Savior of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are a sweet savor of, of uh, we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ and them that are saved, and in them that perish. So either way, whether, whether we're uh, uh, whether it's to the saved or the them that perish, we are a sweet savor under God in Christ. 
He said to the one, we are the savior of death unto death, and to the other, we are a savior of life unto life. You know, has any, now do we change person to person? Does the, does the message we bring change? No, it's the same message. It's how they receive it. Some people, it's going to be a message of death that, you know, you're condemned, that, that the Bible condemns us, that, the, you know, the law condemns us. They're going to reject Christ. That's, that's you know, uh, they, they, they're condemned already because they, have, they believe not. John chapter 3. You know, he that believeth is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed. So they become, we become a savior of death unto them. Now the person that receives it, we become a savior of life. But it's the same message. So we should always be patient with folks out there and understand that when we're being rejected or if things aren't going our way or if it's a hard area, that we're doing what we're supposed to do. It's not up to us how it's going to be received. So that's one reason why patience you know, is so important. Because it's going to help us get along with others. You know, within the church, with the unsaved that we, we rub uh, elbows with out in the world, with the unsaved that we talk to when we go out and try to preach the gospel. You know, that's why patience is so important. But another reason why patience is so important is because it's necessary if you're going to have any real joy in this life. You know, if you're going to have any real joy, you're not just going to go through life and it's just going to be this long, bitter drudgery that you're just trying to get through day to day. You know, you're going to have to have patience. You know, patience comes before joy. And, and, and uh, we're going to see that here in a minute. Because here's the thing. You've you got to have patience in life if you're going to have any joy. It's because life, I don't care who you are, is not without its trials. In some shape, for, uh, uh, shape or form, it's going to come to you. You know, life, is just by its very nature, is trying. It's difficult. You know, we're living in a fallen world. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, I'll read for you. Go over to James chapter 1. But it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Yea, and all that will live godly shall suffer persecution. He said everybody, anybody who's going <coughs> to live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Not might, be, not might, not could, there's potential. No, he said it's going to happen. You know, if you're Christian, it's going to happen. You're going to go through trials in this life. But here's the thing, that's why patience because, becomes so important because Patience is not only going to allow you to endure that, but it's going to allow you to do it joyfully. That you're going to uh, be able to rejoice in all, in all your persecutions. That it's actually going to be a source of joy in your life. How is that so? Well, that's what the Bible says. If you're there in James chapter 1, look at verse 2. He says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Now, temptations there... You know, that's not talking about necessarily the temptation, you know, to do some wicked sin. He's talking about when you go through a trial of your faith. You know, when you go through some temptation or a trial. These words are used synonymously. So he's saying, look, count it joy when you're going through a difficult time. Count it joy. Now, is that our first reaction? Is that, in, is that human nature? Is that instinct? Say, oh, great. You know, persecution, <coughs> afflictions. You know, no, that, that is, that, it's, that's contrary to our nature. But he's saying here, look, you need to count it joy. That ought to be something that gets you excited that you're going to go through persecution, that you're going to suffer, uh, you're going to suffer for the cause of Christ. He says this in verse 3, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Why should you be glad about that, about going through these persecutions? Because it's going to make you a more patient person. And he said, Let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect, meaning complete, entire, wanting nothing. You know, there was, a, I, had my, I had a pastor back in Michigan and, you know, he, every once in a while I would come to him and I would say, man, this is going, not going right. Or I expressed some grievance about life, you know, or there was some responsibility that I didn't want to have to, to take on or whatever it is. And I, I, you know, I'd bemoan my circumstances and he'd just kind of smile and nod and he'd say, well, life goes on. That was it. That was his counsel. Life goes on. <laughs> And whenever he'd say it, man, it would just, it just grate my nerves. It would just, it was like, what do you mean? That's it? That's all you, not, you know, he didn't coddle me and say, oh, you poor thing. You know, it's not fair. Life's not fair to you. You say, well, you know, life goes on. You'll get over it. You'll see. You know, and, 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 and now looking back, I can understand what he meant by that. You know, that, hey, get over it. You know, just be patient. You'll see. Life, life will move on. This isn't the end of the world that you think it is. You know, it, there's, you're going to come, you're, the, the, the you're going to make the bend. You know, there's a bend around the river. You're going to make it, and, and there's, it's going to be smooth sailing for a while. 
But life goes on. And, you know, that's, that's what we need to understand is that when we're going through some diverse temptation, when we're going through some trial or difficulty in our life, whatever it is, is that life goes on. And we should count it joy because we're going to look back on that one day and say, wow, you know, I've become a more patient person because of that. You know, I'm, I'll, I'll be perfectly honest and frank is that I, you know, you think I'm bad now. I used to be a real hothead when I was younger. I used to get mad at just the dumbest things. I remember one time, this is something, this was a key turning point in my, li in my young life at when I was like 21 or 22 years old. I went and uh, I had this junky car like every other, practically every other car I've ever owned. <laughs> and I, this thing was breaking down on me and I remember I was just so frustrated. I got out of the car and I just proceeded to kick the car. <laughs> I'm kicking the fender. I'm kicking all the one down one side, back up the other, just kicking this car. Just letting out all my anger and my frustration. What happened is I, I became very impatient. I lost, you know, I wasn't counting it all joy that I was going to learn a new mechanical skill and how to make car repairs. No, I was just blowing my top. You know, I, and uh, I went off and then it dawned on me when I got done, when I, when I, you know, blew out all my steam and my leg was sore and I'd hurt my foot. I stepped back and the car was still broken, but now it's full of dents. And I realized something at that moment that didn't fix anything. It made everything worse because I became impatient, you know, and I don't know what I'm going off on that for, but <laughs> what that has to do with the sermon. But, you know, I thought it was a good example of, you know, we need to just learn that, you know, rather than just losing our cool in life, we need to just understand we're going to go through something and uh, it's for our own good, you know. Now when there's a mechanical problem, I'm not going to say that there aren't every once in a while, you know, some choice words that are used. If there's something <laughs> try, but I'm, it's when I'm trying to actually make the car repair. You know, you're trying to get that nut out or that bolt out or whatever. And now, you know, I've gone on, I'm replacing sway bars and bushings and you know, control arms and this and that. They, you know, did a tire front end in a car once practically, you know, and, you know, but I wouldn't have gotten that if I had to become a more patient person. You know, the impatient person would just say, well, you know, forget it. Just buy another car or whatever. So we need to learn to be patient and understand that when you're going through some trial, some temptation, when things aren't going right in your life, they aren't going right for you, that's an opportunity for you to become a more patient person, to be able to look back and say, oh, I've been through that. You know, and then when somebody else comes to you and says, oh, I'm doing this, I got to go through this, and I go through that, and this and that, you can do what my pastor did and say, well, life goes on. Because you know that now, that, hey, I've been through that. Life does go on. You just need to be patient. <coughs> so that's why patience is, is so important. Because it's going gonna, it's gonna to it's gonna prevent life from robbing you of the joy that you can have. That when we go through these trials and temptations that, you know, we can, we, can, uh, we can actually rejoice in that because we know we're being made better for it. Go over to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. I want to show us something here in Romans chapter 5. <coughs> Romans chapter 5 and verse 3, it says this, Not only so, but we glory in tribulations. He didn't say we glory when tribulations are over. He didn't say we glory when everything's calm and life's easy. That's not when Paul said we're glorying. He said, look, we glory in tribulations, in the midst of it, while it's going on. That's when the glory is. That's when we're rejoicing, when we're going through these difficult times. Goes on and says, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Say, I'm going through some trial. I'm going through some difficulty. Life isn't easy. Great. You should glory. Because it's going to make you a more patient person. It's going to make you more understanding, kind, meek, humble patient that's going to be able to instruct others also. <laughs> he, says, and he says that uh, knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patient experience and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is spread abroad in our hearts. Go over to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, I'll begin in verse 9. It says, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. Again, when are, when are we to be patient? In the tribulation. Not after, because tribulation is what's going to take to make us a patient person. So that's why patience, you know, is, is an important thing to have this morning because it's going to, you know, life is going to demand it of you. 
if you're going to move through this life with in, without it just becoming just this, you know, drudgery, this sob story that you're, you're living out, you know, you're going to have to develop patience. And uh, patience is important because it's going to help us get along with other people. And patience is important because, you know, it's, it's something that's necessary to live this Christian life if you're going to make it. But, you know, patience is also important because it's what's going to make you fruitful in this life. You know, if we just go through life and all we're worried about is our circumstances and when is this going to be over and all we're ever focused on is, is how difficult things are, you know, that's going to make us less fruitful. We're not going to be the fruitful Christians that we could be. Now, if you could look over to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. Of course, Luke chapter 8 is the parable of the sower where Jesus talks about a sower that went forth to sow and he cast his seed uh, where he would and some fell upon uh, stony places and some fell upon the byways and some of it fell upon good ground, right? That's what we're going to look at here. He said in verse, uh, verse 14, And that which fell among thorns are they which, uh, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with the cares and the riches of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. So it's good seed, right? And what's interesting about this parable is there's nothing wrong with the ground itself. The ground is capable of, of supporting life. I mean, that's what the thorns are growing in. That's why all these, these, these other plants are there to, that are going to choke out the word that's sown in his heart. So the problem isn't the ground and it's not the seed. It's the problem is that this person hasn't taken the time to get that out of there. They haven't gone and weeded out their life of all the things that they need to get out that are going to choke the word. And what are those things, those, those vines that are growing up, those thorns? It's the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life. We get so caught up, we get so entangled with the affairs of this life that you know, it'll, choke, uh, it'll choke the word and we'll have no fruit. But he, on, uh, goes on in verse 15, but that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with what? With patience. You know, they understand, like, if you're going to be fruitful in this Christian life, it's not going to happen overnight. You're not going to just wake up tomorrow and be super Christian. You know, you're, it's going to, you know, it's line upon line, here a little, there a little. You know, it says, they that are, the, the Bible says, that whom, to whom shall he teach doctrine? They that are drawn from the breast. It's being weaned from the milk of the word of God and moving on to the meat of the word of God. That's the person that's going to become fruitful. It's a person that's patient, that's going to stick in it, that's going to be there for the long haul, that's going to be able to have uh, the right attitude when they go through difficult times. You know, if you show me somebody who's very fruitful in their life, a, a very knowledgeable Christian, somebody who's winning a lot of souls, is doing a lot of work for the Lord, you show somebody, some, show me a fruitful man like that, and I'll show you a very patient man. The people who are doing the most work <clears throat> that I know for the Lord, that are getting the most done, are also incredibly patient people with, with, with others. So patience is important because it's going to make you fruitful in this life. That's what you need if you want to bear fruit in the Christian life. You need to have patience. You need to, to, to run the race. Because patience, you know, is what keeps you focused on the work. You know, you're not going to get distracted by all these other things. You're going to, you're going to uh, not get distracted by the cares, the riches, and the pleasures of this, of this world. Because if you think about it, uh, you know, the impatient, impatient people, they do get easily distracted. Because they are, they're the type of person that wants to be distracted by the cares and the pleasures and the riches of this life. And we're living in a culture that panders to instant gratification. I want to be entertained now. I don't want to have a moment's boredom. You know, enter the smartphone. Enter any multitude of social media apps where we can, you know, we never, we can, we, we never even have to endure a moment of not being entertained anymore. You know, we can just pull out the phone and we're entertained. Instantly gratified. You know, or, or even we think about with like food. You know, there's food on every corner. You know, if, we're, if we get the slightest twinge of hunger, you know, bam, we're in the Taco Bell drive-thru. And I'll say this, if you're in Taco Bell down here, you're, you're not, you know, no way you're right with God. <laughs> you're in Tucson, people. Don't you be in no Taco Bell, right? All right, anyway. This, this message was not brought to you by Taco Bell. But uh, people that are, are impatient, they're going to get distracted very easily because they want to. And there's a whole culture that's ready to just in, in, indulge that for them. So patient people, they're going to stay focused on the work. You know, they're going to be, you know, I know that, you know, 
My wife was just telling me on the way down here about this marshmallow test with kids. This book where they, 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 they did these, these tests with children. And they'd say, look, you can have one marshmallow now, but if you wait 20 minutes, you can have two. And then they, they, they have all these analysis and everything about what kind of kid eats the one immediately. It says a lot about what type of person you are. You know, like, well, you know, I'm going to eat the one now because, uh, you know, I don't, I don't trust you. You know, you know. And they said that too, that, that kids that, that didn't have a strong father figure or came from a broken home, that the lady would say, here's a marshmallow, I'll be back in 20 minutes to give you another one if you wait and don't eat it. They, those kids would immediately eat it because they didn't trust that person was going to come back to give them something else, which is heartbreaking. <laughs> that's pretty sad. But, you know, that's the, that, that's the type of world that we're living in is that people are, you know, it, it, you know the, the patient person's going to say, I want two marshmallows. You know, and if it means I have to wait 20 minutes, that's what I'm going to do. But the impatient person says, just give me that marshmallow now. You know, I don't care. But they're not thinking about tomorrow. They're not worrying about down the road. They just want to be gratified right now. They want the cares and the pleasures and the riches of this life. They're not worried about bringing forth fruit unto perfection because that takes time. That takes effort. That takes energy. That takes consistency to, to day in and day out, live for the Lord, read the Bible, know the Bible, go out, Win souls, you know, raise the family, do everything that is involved with the Christian life. It takes time, energy, effort, consistency, and, and impatient people have no they just don't want anything to do with that. They just want it now. They want everything right now. And you know, the truth is is that anything that's worth having is worth waiting for. Think about that. If you want something bad enough, you have to ask yourself, well, is it worth waiting for? And if it's not worth waiting for, then it's probably not worth having. And anything that's worth having is worth waiting for. And there's another saying. It says, easy come, easy go. Right? Why is it some people are never going to bring forth fruit with patience? Because everything came easy to them. All the cares, the pressures, and the riches of this life, they come very easy. But you know what? Those things go just as easily too. And then it's on to the next thing and on to the next thing. So let me just conclude by you know, saying this, that you know, patience is, imp is important this morning. And hopefully I'm making a case for it. You know, hopefully we're seeing that. And it's proven by the fact that it's not something that's easily acquired in the scripture, is it? Patience isn't us just waiting. It's not, you know, anybody can do that. Anybody can go sit somewhere and just wait for something to end. That's not patience. Patience is, is, is something that's not easily acquired because patience is having the right attitude while you wait. We should desire and we should pray for patience. We should want that for our lives. But you need to understand something. Be careful what you wish for, right? That's what people say. But, you know, I, Lord, make me patient. Lord, help me to have patience. Are you, are you sure you want that? Because the Lord will, he will. He'll give you every opportunity. And uh, it just might not be the way you think. You know, God's not just going to download patience into your mind. You know, it's not the matrix. You're just going to plug in and wake up and be like, I'm patient. You know? <laughs> I know how to be patient now. No, he's, God's going to say, all right, well, let's put you through a trial. Let's put you through a tribulation. Let's put you through some temptations. Let's bring some difficult circumstances into your life. And let's try your patience. And then, <clears throat> when you get done with it, then you can have joy. <clears throat> you know, the few times that somebody has openly accused me of being patient, and this has happened, people said, you know, Brother Corbin, you're a patient person. Now, they said that, not me. Okay, so you can take it up with them if you disagree. But the few times that such an accusation has been leveled against me has been when they've observed me during stressful situations, you know, such as these, these soul winning trips. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm glad for the soul winning trips. But when you're taking large groups of people to strange towns you've never been in, and their every, you know, their, their room and board is your responsibility, and their productivity is your responsibility. You're planning out their whole day and everywhere they're going and everything that comes up is, is on you, right? <coughs> that can try your patience. Parents know what I'm talking about. Parents who've had kids for any length of time know, that, you know, the, first, like the fifth or sixth time the kid asks that same question over and over again. You know, the patience is tried all the time, right? But that's, that's when someone's, you know, the point being is that's when, that's how you acquire patience is by going through difficult circumstances. That's how we find out if you really are a patient person. Not when everything's great and easy and, and smooth sailing. It's when you're going through that tough, turbulent time in your life. You know, that's when we see what we're really made of. 
And uh, I know I said I'm closing, but go over to one more passage. Go to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, I'll just read to you, Give no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, but all things approving yourselves as the ministers of God in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, and fastings. He's saying, look, you, you, you want to approve yourself as a minister of God in much patience. And then he lists all these other things that none of them are positive, none of them are pleasant. Afflictions, necessities, distresses, stripes, imprisonments, tumults, labors, watchings, fastings. And he's saying, look, you're going, to, you're, going to, uh, you're going to approve yourself as the minister of God when you go through these things. Because here's the thing, an unproven patience is an unknown patience. You very well may be a, a patient person this morning, but we'll never know that until we see you go through that. You'll never know that about yourself until you actually go through something like that. <clears throat> That's when you find out how patient you really are is when you have to go through some of these afflictions and necessities and so forth. And here's the thing about patience. You say, well, you know, you convinced me. I want to become a patient person this morning. I want to work on that. Well, it's not something, like I said, it's just going to come naturally. It's something that has to be pursued. You have to determine that you're going to be a patient person. And, you know, so often for myself, that's when I realize how impatient I really am. As I say, I'm going to work on being a more patient person. Then I begin to realize immediately how impatient I really am. Like, wow, I'm an impatient person. I need to work on this. <clears throat> the Bible says in 1 Timothy 6, Thou man of God, flee these things. Follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience. He said you have to follow after it. You have to pursue patience. He said, give all diligence. Add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience. It's something that's added to your faith. It's something that's pursued in your faith. It's not just, you know, just something that's just going to manifest itself in your life. And if you're going to pursue patience, it's going to take you through tribulations. It's going to take you through distresses because that's where it's acquired. So, of course, you know, pray that God would grant you patience because, again, it's necessary. We've got to have it if we're going to make it. Pray that God would grant you patience, but understand how that prayer is going to be answered. It's going to be by creating an opportunity to test that patience. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. For this cause we, all, uh, for this cause we also, since the day we heard of it, heard it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthen with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering and jo with joyfulness. So why is patience important this morning? Well, because it's a necessary attribute that allows us to benefit others you know, around us helps us to get along it allows us to bear fruit in our own lives spiritually and you know it's something that's going to be required patience is going to be required for us to uh, make it through the trials and tribulations that come not only in life itself but in life as a christian trying to live a christian life and patience is important this morning because without patience we're never going to know true joy I mean, that, if, we're gonna, if we really want to know what, what, what true joy is in life, we're going to have to develop patience because it's more often when we come out on the other side of those tribulations that we experience the most joy. Let's go ahead and pray.